well um, call the order the December 10th, 2020 business meeting and uh, ask the uh, County Administrator, Gary Schmidt, to please take the roll. Uh, thank you, Chair. First, our staff support today, Christina Twilliger, Clerk to the Board, uh, Stephen Madcore, County Council. He's in the attendees list, but he's here, so he'll be in here shortly. And then uh, Rich Marvin and Gary Teague from Public and Government Affairs helping with the recording today. Uh, roll call, Chair Bernard. Here. Commissioner Savas. Here. Commissioner Humberston. Here. Uh, Commissioner Fisher is on her way. Commissioner Schrader is at a National Association of Counties Symposium for Large Urban County Caucuses and will not be at today's meeting. And I assume that's virtual. That's virtual for Commissioner Schrader, yes. Okay. All right, please join me in a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We are holding this meeting virtually. If you've joined us on a Zoom app for this meeting and you are interested in providing public comment, we'll prompt you regarding how to do that when the time is right. You will have the option of providing your comments to us live, or alternatively, you can email us at bcc at clackamas.us. Be sure to include your name in the area from which you live. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Gary. Thank you, Chair. We'll begin with wildfire updates both, uh, with Nancy Bush, Director of Disaster Management and Incident Commander of the Emergency Operations Center. Please go ahead, Nancy. All right, thank you and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, so just a few things to update you on on the wildland fire. Um, as I mentioned on Tuesday, the individual assistance program has closed. Um, so I won't be doing a lot of updates on those numbers, uh, maybe the dollar amounts, but those numbers will stay the same at this point. Um, but just to remind everyone, we have, have requests for public assistance um, in our FEMA grant portal. We have 13 here in Clackamas County, which includes our cities, school districts, uh, water districts, et cetera, and including Clackamas County. And that was as of December 7th, and there's still time to get that in if you need to. Um, we still have estimated properties with wildfire damage at 110, and we have 62 residences that have been damaged or destroyed. And we also have in some sheltering uh, with social services right now are five families here in Clackamas County due to the wildland fires. Um, just a few other things uh, for some of the capacity building and planning and for economic development. I just wanted to mention that our Clackamas Workforce Partnership has received some federal funding uh, through the state to work uh, directly with public agencies such as public schools, our city and county parks, recreational departments, um, and the county itself to um, employ some individuals that could help with some cleanup or repair. Um, and it includes labor um, that can be put on site with the, as long as their supervision, they have the right tools, equipment, et cetera. So we're working with them right now to see how that can best serve our county. And, um, you know, hopefully steering a lot of people toward the repair piece since of course cleaning up debris is uh, pretty technical as well. Um, we also continue uh, to work with ODOT um, on our IGA, which we did get on Monday. We're turning in some of the comments that we have for that IGA today. Uh, we're finishing that up hopefully this morning so we can get that in. Um, so yeah, our county council's worked on that pretty diligently. Uh, there's just a couple things we want to make sure that are very clear in the IGA. So we'll be sending that in and hopefully the work can begin pretty quickly after we get that signed. From what we can tell, uh, they would like for all of the counties that are going to have PPDR, which is personal property or debris removal, as well as tree remo removal, which is the public assistance piece. They want all of the counties to sign the same IGA. So we'll be hopefully working that next week and getting it signed hopefully in the next week. And that is my brief update on wildland fire. Um, any questions? I'm trying to get the participant screen up, but my screen's so small, I can't find it. Chair Bernard, there's no okay. hands. <laughs> All right, there's no hands. All right. 
Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> next COVID-19 update, we have Philip Mason Joyner, our County Public Health Director and Co-Incident Commander of our Emergency Operations Center. Please go ahead, Philip. Thank you, Gary, and good morning, commissioners. Christina, as always, if you can share the slideshow. Okay, appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on COVID-19. Our weekly case count data is displayed here. Uh, for the first time in a long time, we did have less cases in the last reporting period. So we are very appreciative of that. And we will, it's really too early to make a whole lot of sense of that. We will see in the coming weeks what this really ends up looking like. Um, but we did yesterday or today have under 100 cases um, for the first time in quite a while. So I know that the public health team is very excited about that in terms of um, the amount of cases being reported and um, contact tracing work that we're doing. Next slide, please. Um, here are the metrics to display. They've become a lot more simplified now. For This is both for schools being able to provide in-person instruction and also for reopening businesses. So um, not a lot of changes this week. The case count is still very high. We are still in the extreme risk category for businesses and schools are still expected to be in comprehensive distance learning mode for now. Next slide, please. I would say in general, we still have not seen the impacts from Thanksgiving gatherings. Um, we expect to see it in still the coming days and weeks. Um, we're still thinking that um, because of this being holiday season and winter that our case counts we're anticipating will still continue to match up with projections being high Hospitalizations are still at an all-time high over the past three weeks. We're meeting frequently with our hospital partners to monitor bed capacity. And um, um, that is something that is still a top priority and something we're concerned about. No changes on that front. Um, I really appreciate kind of this framing and I have a few new, new visuals and data to share. Um, this, this shows our case breakdown by age group. And um, you can see that our younger, our younger um, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, folks in their teens really are dri driving our case increases. And while um, these, these individuals may not, may not be at risk for severe illness or hospitalization or death from COVID-19, um, the concern is that they impact other people who are, are at higher risk folks in their lives that, that um, do have um, a much higher possibility of complications from COVID-19. This is Clackamas County specific information on our cases to date. Next slide, please. Um, we, you know, you'll often see that someone has died from COVID-19 and also had underlying health conditions. So just, just shows you for Clackamas County specifically, the different, um, different types of underlying health conditions that we receive data on. Um, if you're you know, a person who has cardio cardiovascular disease, they're five times more likely to be hospitalized than, um, than the rest of the cases. If you're um, someone with chronic liver disease, you're four times more likely to be hospitalized. If you are someone who is classified as, as, as obese, you're 2.6 times more likely. And if you are a current smoker or were a former smoker, you're 2.5 times more likely to be hospitalized. Next slide, please. Um, it's been communicated out widely in, um, in Clackamas County, um, similar to the state of Oregon and to the country, we do see that our people of color living in the community um, do um, disproportionately contract COVID-19. Um, in Clackamas County, about 15% of our population identifies as a person of color, and that, that comprises of about 45% of our cases of COVID-19. Um, we, we spend a lot of time working with our partners around the Hispanics, our Latinx population. Um, you know, a lot of these, these individuals are essential workers working in farm, working grocery stores, working in our long-term care facilities. Um, so making sure that um, these work sites have access to testing, that we're working with um, partners that are um, culturally responsive to meet these communities' needs have been a big focus for us.
Uh, this is the surface area map. I believe Dr. President shared this last week. It shows you just the different um, proportions that you can see visually in terms of um, the different outbreaks that we have. And I don't know if, I know Commissioner Fisher had a question um, earlier this week just about why do we still have um, outbreaks in schools? Um, daycare seem to be getting a little bit um, larger over time. And so for schools, I'll, I'll just say that um, outbreaks take quite a while to close. Um, if you have one case and, and then they become linked to each other, it takes a while before um, really th that, that is contained and folks have com all the folks connected to that initial, initial case have completed their quarantine and isolation. Also, while, while our schools are doing distance learning, there's still activity happening at schools. Um, there's still limited in-person instruction for um, individuals with special needs or that need additional support. We still have um, teachers and other professionals that are working in schools. So if they're working in a school, that counts towards a school outbreak as well. Next slide, please. Um, here are the metrics again, just displayed in the way that we've usually been uh, sharing this information. Test positivity is something of interest. And the next slide um, shows you a little bit more information about testing that we think is um, pretty important. You can just see um, this is the state of Oregon data. So 171,000 tests per week right now. Um, test positivity with that increase is going up, um, which is a good indication of looking just at, um, at um, folks that are symptomatic and the demand for testing right now. Uh, right now in Clackamas County, we are, we're seeing about 20 to 22,000 tests per week in late November, early December. And um, compared to spring and summer, we were seeing just about 7,000 to 10,000 tests. Um, so we've certainly increased access, but we also are seeing a lot more people needing testing, folks that have been, in con been potentially exposed or folks who um, are symptomatic. And, and their healthcare provider is um, encouraging them to get tested. And my final message for folks, you know, the holiday season is still upon us. Um, and we often get asked, you know, what is the guidance? Um, this is, the guidance really doesn't change. <laughs> Keeping your distance, limiting your social interactions, wearing your face covering, those are all such important um, tools, but we also understand the behavioral and mental wellness that folks have the need to connect and their traditions to keep those alive. And that this is really hard for friends and families, especially this time of year that you wanna be connected. I understand, we get that. Um, so my guidance in general would be to really focus on what are those most important things to you this season. Focus, focus on picking you know, that one activity that you want to do as a group to really dedicate yourself to limiting your risk so that you can do that safely, to really reduce your exposure the week before, the week after, monitor your symptoms really, really closely. You certainly do not want to risk um, the gift of uh, a pretty nasty and potentially deadly um, virus during the times that you are gonna get together this holiday season if you choose to do so. And um, before we go to questions, I know Nancy wanted to give a really short update on um, some of the support that we're providing to businesses. So Nancy, if you wanna share that first, we'll then, we can then open up for questions. All right, thank you, Philip. Yeah, so I just wanted to update the board on the, it was about $4.1 million that we got from the governor's office for businesses. And we found out that it is actually CARES dollars, which means we have to spend that 4.1 million by December 30th. So we met yesterday, Lori Zittner and her staff of course are working on this very diligently because we really wanna get this out to our communities and wanna to have to do it obviously quickly. So we have to use some things that are in place in order to do that. So I wanted to update you today on what we're looking at and Administrator Schmidt has also been a part of these conversations and we will have to get things signed very quickly which we will work uh, through our county administrator to get that done. So there were 811 business applications and 125 child care applications that we recently received in uh, when we sent everything out, which I believe was at the beginning of 
December, I think. Uh, my days are running together. But we don't have enough funds to fund all of those applicants that are eligible. So we are going to take part of that $4 million and make those individuals, you know, and give those, those businesses the, the dollars that they applied for and that they are eligible for. So that will take um, quite a chunk of the dollars that we're looking at. And then after we get that done, we are going to do a very simplified self-certified application uh, for hospitality, hospitality and personal services businesses. <laughs> and that will be $2,500 to $3,000 flat amount. So we're still working on how much that's going to be. Our thoughts around that were, um, you know, it's like this is going to be restaurants, salons, those types of things that, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can give them enough that they, they can at least pay, for example, a month's rent um, because we know that that has been really difficult for businesses. So we really would like to do something that's, you know, more creative that, you know, we've he heard people, it's like, well, can we do something like Multnomah County or Washington County did? Um, we simply don't have time for that. Again, Multnomah County and Washington County got, and Portland got money up front where we did not. So uh, we have been very limited in how creative we could be with the dollars, but we think that this is a very fair way to get more of these dollars out to our businesses and also help, you know, that gap that, you know, we had so many that applied and we just didn't have enough dollars to do that, to go ahead and get those dollars out for those particular businesses as well. So Philip and I will open it up for questions now. Uh, so Ken and then Paul. Uh, just one quick question. I was wondering on our um, at PGA, if we're doing any kind of social, aggressive social media outreach to that cohort of people in the, 20s and 30s that apparently are the you know the ones that are <laughs> carrying it to uh, to others and uh, seeing if we can and uh, maybe slow that down a bit yeah since that seems to be the, the the least responsible cohort at the moment yeah Philip do you want to take that one yeah in terms of behavior change within those age groups it, it's a challenge for our communication staff to work through that um, they are partnering regionally and um, with Multnomah in Washington County and the state. Um, there have been some firms that have been hired to help bring communications, I believe is one of them, um, really trying to um, do creative um, communications efforts around that population. This, and it, it, I would say, you know, certainly learning from some of our universities in the state about how they're trying to help message and communicate um, with those populations, that's been helpful. Yes, so they, we are pushing out messaging. Um, there's certainly more, I think, that we need to do. In addition, so I'm sorry, in addition to that too, the quiz that Sue Hildick talked about either last week or the week before is also from just Clackamas County is targeted toward that age group as well. Okay, so are they using things like TikTok and, and, and um, uh, Instagram and some of the others that uh a lot of young people use we are definitely on instagram i know that okay thank you all yeah philip uh, could you go back to the slide uh or slides that you had with, uh, with uh, regarding age propensity for illness related stuff yeah I'll look to christina i'll look to you to put that up please Here we go. Okay. So um, in this slide and then Christina, the next, the following slide. So on this slide, my question was uh, people, is this, in this, is this chart basically health propensity for health issues in general or specifically related to COVID? This is specifically related to COVID. Okay. All right. Um, could you go to the slide of the testing? It's the following one or two after this on the testing, the graph. There we go, that one. So um, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of people that are are data minded that that uh, derive, you know, 
information from data and just base decisions on data. Um, you know, look at a number of things and there's certainly on this COVID thing on the OHA website and other places, a, a wealth of information sometimes gets confusing. So, you know, I think the argument a lot of people will make when they look at a chart like this and look at the dates, um, you know, we basically doubled testing here since, you know, what, September, October, right? Is that fair? Yeah, we definitely increased testing. Yeah, yeah, which is a good thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not critical of that, but it's it's hard really to gauge folks, um, or it's, it's hard for folks to gauge um, a relationship because people made the relationship. The more testing you do, the, the more positives you'll have. You know, and I think you can, you know, you could argue that that that's statistically probably true. Um, and I know that our numbers didn't go up. You know, whether it's whether you say it's doubled or tripled amount of testing that it didn't go up proportionally, it's well beyond that. So I, I, I worry about, you know, the fact that what ought to be really, you know, a, a complimentary slide, which I've asked for before and a couple of times you all have dis displayed that is the, is the rate of hospitalizations, which is the key issue and probably more for the state of Oregon than any other state in this country. And um, so, Yet Tuesday and today, there is no chart that shows a hospitalization. And I, I think while this slide is valuable, um, it it also can be um, used um, or misinterpreted um, in some ways. And I had a little bit of concern about that. So I, I would, unless there's a reason, is there a reason that we're no longer, you know, last couple of weeks we have been displaying the hospitalization rates. Is there a reason we're not doing that any longer? Um, no, not a reason. I think we're just trying to provide a variety of different information. Um, I'll certainly assure that it's shared next week. Okay. I, I mean, it seems to be all over the all over the media uh, around the country, and it just seems that to, you know that is what um, I have. You know, I, it's dro it's driven a lot of my my. Um, thoughts and, and decisions and, and communications that I really been basing that a lot. And I think the other thing that is really, um, that really, uh, what's the right word here? Um, highlights, if you will, the, the why it's such a critical thing is that Oregon has the lowest hospital beds per capita in the country. Someone can go on the search engine, any search engine, just look up hospital capacity per capita by state. And then you'll find that that Oregon is the lowest in the country. Um, and it, and if you look at other states, which are bigger than Oregon and smaller than Oregon, um, you know, you'll see small states like Montana that have twice as much hospital capacity per capita than we do and states like in the East Coast, like New York and New Jersey that have a heck of a lot more in, in some cases, there are states out there that have three times the hospital rate per capita or hospital beds per capita. So I, I think that really points out that I think the driver should be for a lot of people or the messaging for a lot of people is really the um, precarious position uh, we are all in um, in Oregon with regards to the lowest proportion of hospital beds per capita. So that's why I think that chart would be, again, the chart that you're, it sounds like you are willing to put back up next week is so important um, that we are in a, again, a more precarious position than any other state. Um, and I, and as I look at all the numbers and competing numbers with different interests, trying to argue this or that, I, I, I think at the end of the day, that is one that's hard to deny and it is compelling. Um, so that is my, that's my comments for that. Um, so uh, I have a question for Nancy in regard to the CARES Act dollars and the businesses, the hundred some odd businesses you're mentioning. Is, is, do we have a breakdown of the business types that have applied? I, I don't know. I don't have that with me. I do know, like I said, the child care is broken out, um, but I don't have any other breakouts on that. And I will check with BCS to see how they're tracking that. Okay. The, the reason I ask is that, you know, we've heard from different business owners of different business types about their concerns and the way the OHA and the governor, uh, governor's um, 
orders, if you will, executive order, um, has impacted some businesses um, more um, substantially um, than others, um, and not in a, in a negative way. And some of them have literally been shut down. And we have heard from a lot of them. So I, I would hope, and I'd like to see maybe the list of businesses to make sure that we're covering some business types that have been the hardest hit. Yes. Um, and I'm sorry. We I just found out that we can do that, and we can get that to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say that the ones we probably heard the most from um, that have said, we haven't had any outbreaks, we haven't had any cases, and yet we're being unfairly, or unduly, uh, disproportionately punished. And, and gyms and um, uh, uh, healthcare type um, facilities like that, um, that do training and so forth. And that, that's, that's obviously sometimes prescribed by, by doctors and health practitioners as a means to stay healthy. Um, and so when we take away some of those facilities that offer really offer those services to stay healthy, it seems as though we are, um, you know, we're, we're kind of, I won't say conflicted, but it doesn't seem to um, make some sense. I get the fact that people working out will, are, are, he are breathing heavily sometimes. They're getting their cardi cardio up. I get that. And ventilation is a huge issue, but also square footage in those kinds of buildings uh, is also a big issue. And some of them are rather large, which I think can actually perform and perform safely um, in this environment, but yet they're not allowed to open period. So I, I would again like to see that breakdown of businesses as a CEO. Okay. Um, Commissioner, and, uh, that, that, that concludes my comments. Uh, Commissioner, I also do have the hospital graph if you want me to bring that up quickly. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, it, it, it's not for my benefit per se. I, I think it's for us sure. it's primarily to message out there so people can see yeah. what we're up against. So yeah, here's what I don't know, Philip, if you want to talk about that, but um, this is actually um, 12 nine. We had 580 COVID patients, but you'll see we are we had a dip and then we're coming back up. And this is hospitalizations. Here we have. Um, those that were on uh, or in ICU beds. And I did talk a little bit on Tuesday about ICU capacity here in our region. And as of Tuesday, we had only in our, which region one again is Clackamas, Multnomah County, Washington, Columbia, Clatsop and Tillamook. We only had 59 ICU beds available, which of course does change day, to, day by day, but I don't think that that has increased. And this is how many we, of course, we have on ventilators. Um, and we still have over 700 ventilators statewide. So we're, where we're really seeing a shortage is with our ICU beds. So I don't know, Philip, do you want to talk about anything else on this graph? I think that's well done. I don't have anything else to add. Okay. Yeah. The, the other one I kind of pointed out before on, on this graph, especially when we see that down, if, if there was a way maybe to display, and it's kind of morbid, but, and I apologize, uh, but um, someone who worked in a hospital before where, you know, one day you have a patient and, and the patient passed overnight and then that bed is empty. And that is that uh, when we have averaging, what, last few days here, we've had, you know, 20, 30 people a day dying in Oregon. So yes. that brings those, that, that opens up beds momentarily and then they're filled. So that graph, even this graph is somewhat misleading in the sense that we're not calculating in the the uh, the beds that are emptied by virtue of people passing away. Absolutely. It's a, sad, it's a very sad thought, but I think it's yeah. important. No, that that's absolutely up. true. Um, and then and just for everyone to, the, you know, we have the hospital bed capacity piece here too. And the, you can look at each region here. Um, so for those in the audience, this is on our OHA webpage. And just go to the COVID page and they'll be able to look at these different regions and what's available. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sonia. A quick question. You know, we have 700 ventilators statewide, but our region has 59 approximately ICU beds. So when people need ventilators, around, do they not need those in ICU? I mean, I know there are more regions in the state and there are more beds statewide, but I was just curious about that. It seems like yeah. we have more ventilators than ICU beds. So yeah, if you're in an ICU bed with COVID, you don't necessarily need a ventilator. You could be there for other severities. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know, Philip, there's, but yeah, statewide, we, right now we do have 
several ventilators, yeah, more and ventilators and, than beds. Yeah, Absolutely, and, yeah. And the bed capacity is really around not the actual physical bed and the, the, the equipment, it's around the staffing right now in our region. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Drives for being able to open up beds. Yeah, and I just want to second what Paul was saying, and I really hope we are somehow able to prioritize those businesses that have been hurt by this shutdown. Um, I mean, it's restaurants that can't do indoor dining and a lot of, you know, fitness type of activities which are shut down. It's really, really hurting. And I think we're, I'm hearing from folks a lot, Paul's hearing, I, I'm guessing if, Jim, you're probably nodding. You've heard from folks, and I know I'm pretty sure Ken has as well. That's a real struggle when you, um, you know, you're just barely recovering from the last shutdown, and then, and then uh, you're um, you're to take out only, and that's really tough. We're gonna I don't want to see us lose some of our um, really wonderful, precious restaurants, especially our local, our our smaller restaurants that are. They're not the big chains that can withstand this more easily. But, so I'm concerned about that. So I just want to second what Paul was saying. Hopefully we can prioritize those businesses. All right, uh, Gary, I don't see any other questions. Okay, uh, just Nancy, I'll ask you and Laura, once you have finalized how you're going to distribute those business funds, we need to loop back to the board so they're in the know. We've got some good feedback from them today. Yeah, I will, uh, I'll work with Laura on that and see what MISO can get to us. And hopefully it'll be maybe today or tomorrow, but I will let you know for sure after I speak with Laura. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. okay uh, thank you, Nancy and Philip, uh, for your presentations. Uh, we'll move on then, Chair, to the consent agenda and Christina can read that. So our consent agenda for today, health, housing, and human services, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Gladstone School District for the food pantry program, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with water environmental services, or environment services, excuse me, approval of amendment number 12 to intergovernmental agreement 159159 with the state of Oregon acting by and through its Oregon Health Authority, for the operation and financing of community mental health addiction treatment, recovery and prevent prevention services and problem gambling programs. Approval of intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County for psychiatric consul consultation services. Approval of intergovernmental agreement with Clackamas County District Attorney's Office for legal support or legal assistance to support mutual clients in the adult drug court program. Under Department of Transportation and Development, approval of a resolution declaring the public necessity and purpose of acquisition of rights of way easements and fee property for the South End Road at Milepost 3.8 project and authorizing good faith negotiations and condemnation actions. Approval of a contract with PBS Engineering and, and, and Environmental Incorporated for the Redland Road turn lanes at Ferguson and Bradley project. Approval of a governmental or government um, addendum with Kaiser Creek Project Manage Manager LLC for the Oregon Community Solar Program, Kaiser Creek Solar Project. Approval of a government addendum with Kaiser Creek Project Manager LLC for the Oregon Community Solar Program, Sandy River Solar Project. Approval of our government addendum with Kaiser Creek Project Manage or LLC for the Oregon Community Solar Program Dunn Project. Approval of a government addendum with Kaiser Creek Project Manager LLC for the Oregon Community Solar Program Mount Hope Project. Approval of a personal services contract with Harper Hoof Peterson Rahelis <laughs> Incorporated to provide Monroe Street improvements for the development agency. Under business and community services, approval of a local grant agreement between Clackamas County and Micro Enterprise Services of Oregon for MISO to provide a small grants program on behalf of Clackamas County in an effort to support the local business and child care provider community impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. Under juvenile department, approval 
of amendment to an intergovernmental agreement with Oregon Health Authority for behavioral rehabilitation services reimbursements. Under disaster management, approval to apply for fiscal year 2020 emergency management performance grant between Clackamas County and the state of Oregon. Approval of a letter of prognulation extending the prognulation date from March 31st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District, Amendment Number 2 to the Co Cooperative Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Milwaukee and the North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District. Under Water Environment Services, approval of an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Gladstone and Water Environmental Services pertaining to the Joint Collection System work. And approval of contract between Water Environment Services and Hack Company to provide flow meters. And that is your consent agenda. Thank you. Do any commissioners want to remove or pull an item from the consent agenda? Yes, I do. Okay, which item? I'd like to pull um, under Roman numeral one, number two, as it relates to water environmental services and our health and housing services. And under under Roman numeral the NCPR, well, I'm just going to say the NCPRD and the West Environmental Services for discussion. Okay. And I'll just approve all for Move. the remainder of the agenda, consent agenda. Ken, what'd you say? I was moving to approve the amended agenda, uh, consent agenda. I think right. Paul and I tried to do it at the same time. Okay. Second. Okay. It's been moved and. Uh, and second, to approve the uh, amended consent agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, wait. Sure, Fisher uh, actually has her hand up. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah, can you not see me? That's all right. Um, I just wanted to mention on this consent agenda, there is an item. I'm not finding it, of course. Oh, it's. A5, and it says that it is approval of intergovernmental agreement with Clackamas County District Attorney's Office for legal assistance to support mutual clients in the adult drug adult program. That caught my eye because the District Attorney's Office does not have clients. They have defendants. And so I was concerned about there being a potential conflict. But I talked to um, District Attorney-elect John Wentworth, and he confirmed that it's not clients that actually should have been worded to say participants. So there isn't a concern about potential conflicts of us providing legal assistance services to participants in the drug program. But that being said, I just wanted to state it to put it on the record. I don't think we need to pull it. I just want to make sure that that is stated. All right, Christina, please pull us. All right, Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Humbertston? Aye. Commissioner Savis? Aye. And Chair Bernard? Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Okay, so then we're on to the discussion of the items that were pulled. Yeah, uh, this question might actually, I'm not sure who can answer it. It's either for the administrator or it's for legal counsel. So um, under Health and Housing Services, um, uh, Roman numeral one there, number two, it relates to a IG or contract with water environmental services. Is that correct? Christina, could you put that up, please? I'm just curious as to why, um, two, two questions, why there's not a corresponding approval under WES for the same, for the same activity, right? So if it requires consent approval for uh, an agreement, why would we not have the same corresponding um, activity and approval under WES? Under Wes? That's question number one. And question number two, um, WES is, um, is a department um, comprised of three districts. And it, it should be, frankly, for the sake of the district, identified which district is, is being affected by this agreement. It's not, it's not identified. You're correct, Commissioner Savas. It should have a dual approval, both by Wes and by the board acting on behalf of uh, H3S. It should. In terms of the content, I do not know. I have not reviewed this IGA. Okay. And 
similarly on the same vein that under under water viral services it does not we're not was not a convening of the district that's impacted by those approvals well Wes is the 190 if you recall Wes is a 190 but when does the district actually approve it we don't care about the district the district doesn't has no autonomy or is just it just is it just some thing out there it it's not overridden by a ORS 190 the activity and responsibility still lies for each of those districts they exist today they have autonomy but the autonomy is not being recognized the district is not being recognized I'm not familiar with this particular arrangement you might want to pull it and have a conversation with Greg Geist I'm not here to pull it I'm really talking about um, as a point of order, I'm really talking about um, how we do business with our districts and how we should be doing business with our districts. It's an issue I've been raising for a number of years, and it continues to be um, ignored, in my opinion. I, I say that respectfully, um, and I, I, I also I have found it troubling, frankly, and I continue to find it troubling that that we are doing this. It's not clear. We're doing this as a Board of County Commissioners. It's not really clear, even though you can title it under West or you can title under NCPRD, um, but really, um, we're really not, we're really not um, convening. We're not even right now even discussing this. Wh which hat are we wearing right now? Are we wearing the hat of county commissioners or are we wearing the hat of which districts or the parks district or whichever it may be? I, I, I think the fact that the board and ourselves are not really, um, taking into, into consideration the district itself or districts themselves that we're not really, um, this is not very clean in my opinion. So that's, uh, and and so when le we have legal counsel here, we do the consent agenda and you're responding, Mr. Magcor, are, are you responding on behalf of the county or the district? I'm responding right now on behalf of the county. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanna shift over to NCPRD um, same issue there, um, as far as identifying that we are convened as a district or not. And I also want to just say, putting that aside, that I just want to just point out, I I'm, I'm, uh, want to thank everyone involved in uh, the bylaws in the city of Milwaukee for approving the amendment, um, all the hard work that staff has done both um, here, at the, here at the county, here at the district. And, and also at Milwaukee and all the citizens who played a role in that. So I just want to acknowledge their hard work. Um, with that, I think I've made my point and I move approval of the remaining items on the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the remaining items on the consent agenda. It might be helpful to, what are the numbers? Just to be clean, what are the numbers? That well, if we want to, want, to, want to be clean, I suppose we could convene ourselves as, as, as each of those, but under number one, that was Health and, Human, Health and Housing Human Services. So under the Board of County Commissioners, uh, I move approval um, of item one, number two. Roman number one, item two. Second. It's been moved in SACA to move approval of item one and two. Uh, uh, any further discussion? So I just have a question. So Stephen Paul raises some really good points. What should our process be moving forward, given his stated concern? Well, for the consent agenda, what you could do is Divide recess it. as the board, convene as NCPRD, approve the consent agenda, adjourn as the board for NCPRD, reconvene as the board and wrap it up for consent agenda. Typically for regular board items, whether it's a housing authority, you do recess as the BCC and convene as the housing authority. It seems like it does get merged in the consent agenda, but no doubt the IGA between Wes and H3S should have dueling approvals, one under H3S and one under Wes itself. Today we're approving the one that's signed by Rich or re requested by Rich Swift for H3S. And so that would be for the count, our county hat. 
That's correct. But my understanding is Commissioner Savas had that one pulled and that the board approved the amended consent agenda. Okay. Yeah, so just po point of order. Um, my motion was to approve Roman numeral one, item two, health and health under health and health, um, health and housing ser human services. Um, that agreement. So that would be convened properly under the Board of County Commissioners as we are at this moment. So therefore, please call the roll. Now, let me ask that. Uh, so Christina, please uh, poll the ca uh, commission. Uh, Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Humbertston? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Chair Bernard? All right, motion carries unanimously. The next item was item. Uh, I believe with not having the consent agenda in front of me, was that Roman numeral two? Roman numeral two, item one. Item one. So we should convene as Wes in this particular one or NCPRD? NCPRD. All right, we'll uh, adjourn as the Board of County Commissioners. And we'll just recess as the board chair. Pardon? We'll recess as the board. Uh, <laughs> I'll recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as the NCPRD board for this item and entertain a motion. Mr. Move Chair, approve. I move we approve approval of um, item uh, Roman numeral two, number one, NCPRD. Second. As removed and seconded that we approve item uh, uh, Roman numeral two, uh, NCPRD, and any further discussion? Christina, please poll us. My unmute. Oh, Commissioner please. Fisher? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Humbertston? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Chair Bernard? Aye. Motion carries. With that, we will adjourn as NCPRD and convene as the Board of County Commissioners for the remainder of the meeting. And Gary, what's up next? Uh, Mr. Chair, point of order. Yeah. Uh, we need to uh, approve the uh, West items. Roman I thought we already three, did. Roman numeral three, one and two. Okay. All right. So we will adjourn as the Board of County Commissioners convene Recess. as the West uh, Board for this next item. Uh, and uh, let, so uh, what's the item number? Well, I entertain a motion. Uh, po point of order, uh, Mr. Madcor, Mr. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, could you tell us which districts uh, were are affected by this? I do not know. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, I, I move we defer this to next week. Yeah, I'll second that. Uh, well, we don't need to do that actually if we don't vote on it. So, all right, so we'll just get further details on this uh, for next week's uh, agenda, okay? So again, I will uh, adjourn as the board of, uh, as with the West and reconvene as the board of county commissioners for the remainder of this item, I mean, uh, this agenda. And up next is public communication. And Christina will moderate this portion, Christina. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll be coordinating public comment for the specific, specific public hearing. <laughs> um, if anyone would like to give comment, please hit raise your hand on Zoom or press star nine if you're by calling in by phone. I will give people a few seconds to do that. I do have one email, uh, so I will just go ahead and read that email. I'm not seeing any hands. The email is from Dan Berg. This is in reference to 19630 South McCord Road in Oregon City, which I purchased in June of 2018. I am now a, in receipt of a certified citation letter dated December 2nd, 2020 from Andrea Hall and code enforcement regarding a permit issue. I've received on several occasions emails from Andrea Hall saying that there were no permits and then saying she found permits and mixing up information to the point of confusion. As with each of those letters I received, I responded both in email and phone messages requesting a list and clarification of the issues. I've yet to receive any return calls or emails 
other than a brief phone call discussion and a few confusing emails, but without a detailed written explanation of the code violations and specifics. The property has a house and cottage built in the 1930s before zoning and a shop. I've been working and continued work with multiple agencies to connect to the sewer for the directions of Clackamas County Departments, which has issued the appropriate uh, permits for the sewer and water. The electrical permits for the house and cottage were updated February 18, 2000, according to PGE records, permit number E0079300. I believe this is a matching permit for PGE records show in December 2014 permits for the shop. Action requested. I'm requesting a and need it, a detailed list of the supposed violations and code numbers for my property at 19630 South McCord Road in Oregon City so that I may respond to them. I've been working with several different departments at the county, uh, city and metro state levels and I'm sure what the issues are so that I may continue working without the county resolving any issues. I'm once again requesting clarification of these issues so that I may respond to them. It has been difficult progress without the specifics. I have in the past and do currently work with all Clackamas County departments without problems. However, there seems to be an issue in communication between Andrea Hall and myself. I'm requesting that a new indep independent person is assigned to the project in hopes of clearing up the issues. Along with the problems encountered with the COVID-19 virus, wildfires, shutdown, evacuations, closing of suppliers, and finding contractors and laborers to do the work. I would like to move forward in solving any problems or issues as soon as possible. And number two, I'm requesting that administrative citation be put on hold for 30 days and miscommunication corrected as we've been working to solve the problem. Also, I get the information I have exchanged and coordinated with the county departments. Thank you for attention to this matter, Dan Birch. Thank you. Any any hands up? Don't doesn't look like it. Don't see any hands up, and I don't have any more emails. All right, great. Thank you. We'll end that portion and move on to county administrator updates. Uh, thank you, Chair. Hey, Jim. Before yeah. we move on, I just want to just ask Gary for the last um, for Mr. Berg's. Um, request. And I'm assuming we're going to put that through and follow up and get an answer to him. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, two pieces of good news to share with you, commissioners, this week. First, the president of Oregon External Affairs for AT&T of Oregon wrote to me uh, thanking our uh, Clackamas County and providing AT&T's gratitude and appreciation for the exceptional staff of Clackamas County that make it possible for AT&T to improve wireless services in the communities we serve. In particular, the uh, letter recognized our transportation and development staff who guided AT&T through a permitting process and land use application process for the company's projects. Uh, the letter recognized Richard Carlson, Doug Rudazell, Richard Nyes, and Glenn Hamburg of our transportation staff for their professionalism, responsiveness, and guidance. So I thank them as well. And thank you to at t for that very gracious letter. Next, our emergency operations staff received some recognition uh, from a member of the public who wrote, thank you very much for your information, especially regarding ICU bed availability information in our region. I am pleased to know there are Clackamas County government employees who are responsive to the citizenry. And at a recent Metro Wildfire Economic Recovery Team meeting, which is led by the governor, governor's office a business representative responded that they are grateful for clackamas county's dynamic website for providing updated information during the wildfires this business representative said that while there was a lot of confusing information out in the public our county website was reliable and very helpful so thank you to our emergency operations center staff and public and government affairs for that communication uh, finally commissioners next week is your last week of business for the calendar year. Your business meeting on December 17th will be conducted in person and remote. So members of the public are invited to attend in person, but we will have to limit the numbers of the public in the room at one time. So we will have an overflow room if we do have a lot of public who choose to attend. Uh, that is my update for today. Thank you. Move on to Commissioner Communication and Sonia, you're up first. 
Mr. Chair, this is such an interesting time with um, the holidays upon us and being in the midst of COVID, it's just a bit surreal. I um, really appreciate how hard our staff have been working and keeping us updated and how hard all of us as a commission have been working to be responsive to community concerns. I am really looking forward to our listening session, which is this afternoon. I think it will give us some good, really good information. And Gary, I just want to thank you for facilitating the um, connection with us and those CARES dollars and, and having that, that loop that we are having input because the turnaround time is very, very fast. So those are the things that are on my mind, but I do want to mention, I participated in a um, county training yesterday. It was mindful communication and it was excellent. I've been, had the privilege of doing a lot of different trainings on mindfulness, especially as an attorney, that's a, um, a big hot topic for lawyers to be mindful. But I tell you that training on mindful communication was um, through our county trainer was great. A lot of, you know, just doing a body scan, seeing how you feel when you're in a conversation, they put categories of red, yellow, green, and gave strategies on how to communicate effectively and intentionally. I uh, really, really enjoyed it. So Gary, again, we're doing great stuff. And I just want to share that with my colleagues. I don't know if that training is going to be available for those that didn't sign up, but I want to encourage my colleagues take advantage of our countywide training. It is excellent. So that's what I have for today. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, Commissioner Fisher, I appreciate that. I think on Saturday we're having a, a training session as well. I hope that um, uh, we are all going to be all participating in that PSU um, training Saturday morning for looks like four hour, four or so hours. Um, uh, what I wanted to um, build on was our discussion last week with regards to um, you know the issue with our quality of life and falling deep into poverty and um, affordability going farther away. And um, following my comments, I believe uh, my colleagues uh, had brought up the minimum wage of $7 an hour. Um, and that uh, the way to, um, to uh, perhaps, or suggested that perhaps the way to remedy um, poverty was to raise the minimum wage. Well, you know, of course the minimum wage in Oregon as of 2021, I believe is 1325. Um, not seven dollars an hour, but you know, I I did a, I did some data searching. I'm going to share a screen here. Um, if you can all just give me a moment. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to be able to do it, so I will I will actually pass on that. But it shows what I did. I, I looked around, and did just com some comparisons, and I compared. Um, uh, Oregon and Washington. I compared Clark County and Multnomah County and other counties that did the comparison. And I found it very interesting that um, Clark County across the river, Clark County, Washington State, um, their poverty rate is half of that of pretty near of um, Multnomah County. They're at 9.2% poverty rate. Their average house, the average median house sale or um, is is about $100,000 less, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, more than that, less than it is in Multnomah County. And, um, uh, and, and of course, that's, and their minimum wage actually is $13.50 an hour. It's actually 25 cents an hour. And, and back a year as the years back, they implemented an increase in the minimum wage. So when we compare ourselves, and I was trying to point out the issue with I think our land use policies um, and a number of other policies are putting a burden on a lot of people and, and frankly forcing a lot of people out of their homes, can't afford to live and they're out on the street. And that is, that is the issue. I've brought up issues about displacement. I've brought up issues about migration. I've, I've brought up issues about, you know, frankly, just people that are on the street that are homeless. So it's, it's you know, it's more than the minimum wage. Um, people that are seniors, um, uh, are, are 
probably not going to be able to work and go to work and get a job. You know, if you're 75 or 80 years old, raising the minimum wage does not make your rent cheaper. And we have a high percentage of population in this county that are se senior citizens. And of course, most of them are retired. They're living on, on a, a, a modest means. Um, and a lot of those are being forced to move somewhere else because they can't afford the rents. Uh, five years ago, um, just in the area that I live, you know, uh, rents have doubled and some people could not simply afford that. And that is, that's been my concern. So I'm looking forward to our conversation next week on displacement as we scratch the surface on this very complex topic. But again, I, I think that we have to be, we have to look at the data. We have to have the data available. And I, and our, I think our handicap is, is really not having really that type of analysis, that type of data to base our decisions on. And we make good decisions based on good information. When we have a, uh, when we are, I won't say arguing, but we're throwing out numbers and we're competing, it seems, um, um, you know, I, I, I think we ought to have a baseline of data that, that um, to base our decisions on when it comes to land use and, everything, and, and virtually everything we do. We need good data, we need good information, and that's what I'm trying to strive for. Um, so I, I, I would appreciate that. The other fa factor in there is not as simple as a minimum wage, obviously, there's tax policy. If you look at tax policy in the state of Washington, it's far different than it is here in Oregon. So I encourage you all to kind of look at the data and do some comparisons of other counties. Um, West Coast, you know, um, other states, other counties, and you'll find you'll find that the poverty rate in areas that have high, high, um, um, high minimum wage, a higher minimum wage than, than, than the federal rate of seven dollars an hour, have as much or more more poverty than than other states, and the housing costs are considerably higher in those states as well. Uh, that concludes my comments for today. Thank you. Kim. No comment. All right. Well, uh, I hope everyone takes care, stays healthy, wears your mask, wash your hands, stay away. If you're sick, stay home. Um, we've got a bridge we have to cross, and it's, uh, it's a ways out there. So that's really all I have to say. Thank you, and we are adjourned.